This, uh, at least the title of this talk is The Future of AI, Machine Programmers and Their Necessary Softwareness. Uh, but hopefully we'll talk about a lot more than just that. And uh, this, this work is a collection of a number of people. Some of my collaborators are listed here. It's probably an incomplete list, so I apologize to any of my collaborators that eventually watch this on the web, and I missed you. <laughs> um, I'll correct that in the future. Uh, so my goal for today is really for us to learn about my research and the cool stuff we're doing at Intel, Brown, MIT, and Texas A&M, but also for us to have a lot of fun. Because these conferences can be pretty intense and these talks can be pretty dry. So hopefully this one will liven things up and by the end of the talk we'll all be laughing and, and good friends. So uh, that's my goal. <laughs> Rate me on that. Okay, so right now artificial intelligence is booming, right? So who, who here thinks that that's happening? Are we in an AI boom today? Cool, great. Does anyone in the room think that's not happening? Okay, I, we see a partial skeptic. That's good, right? It's good to have dissenting views. Uh, so, so let's look at some data that might lead us to believe we're in a bit of a boom. So there's this conference called NIPS, which if you're an AI person, you probably know about NIPS. It's one of the premier conferences for machine learning. And this year, NIPS sold out in 11 minutes and 38 seconds. Uh, that turns out that it's a thousand times faster than it was in 2017. Uh, so that seems like that's, pretty, that's a pretty intense number there. Um, What's really interesting is this, this tweet, uh, it looks like we're comparing NIPS to uh, rock stars at this point, that things are happening that fast. So we're being compared to Beyonce and Taylor Swift or a Hamilton show, that, that's wonderful. Do any of you in the audience have a NIPS paper this year? Awesome, congratulations. So we also have a NIPS paper. And when I saw this, I kind of got the vibe that I should sing at NIPS because we're pretty much gonna be all musicians and like Bono here. So I've been practicing my karaoke and in my mind I think that I'm Bono from U2, but in reality I think I'm actually more like this guy according to my friends. So um, it looks like I have a lot more practice to do before I can actually sing at NIPS, but you and I, we can work on this together. Okay, so we sort of agree that, that AI is booming, and that's a good thing. Um, but there might be some downsides to this. We might be getting ahead of ourselves in some capacity. So I'm gonna focus on three primary areas and then talk about the future of machine programming. So those three areas are gonna be a, a very quick overview of computer vision, then we'll talk a little bit about NLP and NLU, and then autonomous driving. And then we'll start talking about the future of uh, AI in machine programming. So as all of you probably know, computer vision looks something like this. We have these pictures, we're trying to do classification, localization, scene segmentation, uh, lots of very interesting things. And the field of computer vision has seen a tremendous amount of growth, such to the point where there are companies now that are making claims that computer vision can outperform humans significantly. And that is really fantastic. So on one side of the coin, we have computer vision succeeding very well. But sometimes when we rush and we buy a little bit too much into the hype, we can make mistakes. And here are two mistakes that have recently emerged from this company that uh, looks like it's got some problems with its facial recognition. And on top of that, there's this note that they're saying basically this is the most secure AI activation method ever, yet it was found out we could crack this with a $150 mask. So maybe there's some more growth that we need to do with computer vision. If we look at natural language processing, natural language processing is basically this idea that we're gonna take some data from somewhere and it's gonna be in a natural spoken language and then we're gonna do some processing and then make some decisions about it. 
for the natural language understanding, it's a, 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 lit, a bit of a subset of a processing, and it focuses more on trying to understand the semantics, understand the intention, uh, be able to essentially respond, perhaps, to the processing that we're making for the natural language. And that's great. We're seeing some excellent strides in natural language processing and understanding. In fact, this is from earlier this year, where Microsoft is basically saying that an AI now can do, again, a better job than a human can in this space. That's fantastic. On the flip side, it's not always puppy dogs and rainbows. Sometimes we make mistakes. So just out of curiosity, does anyone here know what the Tay chatbot is? Has anyone seen that? Okay, that's great. So the Tay chatbot is actually so controversial, I really can't talk to you about it in this talk. Otherwise, I'll probably never talk at Splash again. What I can tell you is you can follow this link or you can talk to those people that raise their hand and they can tell you about Tay, uh, but I'm not gonna do it. So the takeaway here is Microsoft said, we're sorry. Whoops, <laughs> we're gonna pull Tay off and uh, let you resume your normal Twitter feeds. So again, continuing with the theme, there's a good and then there's a bad of these advances. So now let's quickly move on to autonomous driving. For those of you who aren't familiar with autonomous driving, really there are these six levels and level zero is essentially no autonomy at all. Uh, and level five is this idea of full autonomy where you might not even have a steering wheel. The vehicle may not even have passengers. Um, depending on who you talk to, we're somewhere in the range of two to three. Really, what my research focused on at Intel and with our collaborators at BMW is trying to figure out what we can do to get to level four and level five. And we'll talk a lot about anomaly detection and how that's a really important piece for us to achieve this level four and beyond uh, type of advancement. The key takeaway for trying to get to level four is you essentially need to have perfect anomaly detection and management for it to work. And this sort of makes sense. That if you look at level three, you can see, hey, the person has one hand on the steering wheel, so if an anomaly is detected or not detected, in theory, the human can intervene and take control of the vehicle. But at level four, the human has his or her hands off the wheel. This means that not only do you have to have perfect anomaly detection, you also have to have flawless mitigation of those anomalies. So anomaly detection becomes really a critical piece of technology for us to get to level four and beyond. So one of the biggest manufacturers of autonomous vehicles these days is Tesla. And this article that uh, actually came out on my birthday, so that's great, uh, talks about how Tesla is going to reach full autonomy by the end of 2018. So if you check your calendars, we're, uh, we're getting really close to the end of 2018. Uh, who here thinks we're going to get to full autonomy by December 31st, 2000? Okay, sweet. Me either. Uh, so <laughs> we missed that one. Uh, but that's not to say that Tesla hasn't been making good strides in this space. In fact, um, an article that was just posted by MIT shows that they are in the area of 1.5 billion miles of autonomous vehicles, which is pretty substantial. Uh, that's the predicted uh, growth, I guess, toward um, mid or end of 2019. And so in some sense, Tesla has been making very strong strides in the autonomous driving space. But continuing with our theme, <laughs> it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows. There are some bad things that are happening. So what I'm gonna show you here is a short clip of a Tesla vehicle that is this one, and something goes wrong. But before I show you that, I'm curious if any of you have any guesses on what happened to lead this vehicle to have whatever the state it's in. Does anyone want to just take a guess? Battery explodes. Ooh, battery explodes. That's, that's a great one. Uh, we'll, we'll find out and see. Um, that does happen with Teslas. Uh, anyone else? 
accelerating too fast. Accelerating too fast. So maybe it's just like peeling out and this is like rubber being burned. I like that as well. Any other ideas? That the way it's decelerating too fast. Okay, yeah, that's another great one. You're breaking too fast, that's gonna burn off the tear, and then maybe you're having to smoke back here. Fantastic. Any other guesses? Okay, cool. Let's actually find out. Here we go. Okay, so what I want you to do is pay attention to this vehicle and be ready to be very uh, intrigued on what happens. This is our Tesla autonomous driving vehicle. Okay, so now we know what actually happened to it. It crashed into the side rail that was a road construction uh, hazard, right? So now what I want you to do is watch this video again, and instead of paying attention to the vehicle, I want you to imagine that you are an anomaly detection system, and you're looking for contextual clues that will help you avoid this accident. Here we go. Okay, great. So, let's pause here, and let me ask you, what contextual clues did you see, if any, that you might have been able to use if you're the autonomous vehicle to help prevent having that collision? Yeah? Uh, the car in front and the extra lines that were being painted on towards the end. Okay, that's great, I agree with that. Excellent observation. Anything else in the back? Orange signs, yep, there were there were a few of those. Excellent. Anything else? There's at least one more thing. Uh, you already gave an answer. <laughs> okay, you can give another answer. It's a yellow paint on the left. Yes, the barrier. The barrier, absolutely. Okay, so that's great. Uh, good job. Let's go back. And... Um, before we go through all of these things, very systematically, uh, for those of you who do know me, I always like to introduce my dogs in all of my talks. This is my dog Merlin before the Tesla video. This is Merlin after the Tesla video. <laughs> okay, actually that's really not Merlin. Okay, so what did we just see? We saw an anomalous event. So if you're an autonomous vehicle person, one of the things you probably first notice is that there's a lane shift and the lane markers that are initially providing guidance for that autonomous vehicle are not moving. That's a, big, that's a big problem for AVs today because they're using those lane markers as their guiders, or at least some of those systems are. The second is there's actual construction. So road construction, this is an anomalous event. Now, one of the things that we are focusing on with our anomaly detection research is that everything's in the space of time series. The reason why I showed you the video at the beginning and asked you to try to describe the accident was to try to make the point that it's very difficult to look at the after effect of an accident and understand all of the contextual events that led up to it to help us prevent it. So we need to actually go back in time. We have 13 seconds of video to walk through all of the different um, obstacles or uh, indicators that help us identify this anomaly is coming. There's several contextual clues. The first, as Liz pointed out in the back, there are three, count them, three different road signs that are telling you that this is a problem. One of the things that's really fascinating is they're all on the right side of the road, whereas the actual anomaly is on the left side of the road. 
This means that the space in which we're looking for anomalies has to be significantly uh, more comprehensive than it is today. The second is this barrier. This barrier is a clear indicator that there is some road construction. Hopefully, in the future, we can get our autonomous vehicles to use that information to guide them away from things. And as the gentleman in the front pointed out, the vehicles in front are giving them indicators. It's a very clear indicator right at this point. If we had a better camera, you'd be able to see this more clearly. But this car is already moving outside of its lane to make sure that it supports the traffic that's going to have that lane shift. So the reason why this is important is for us to really achieve level four autonomy and beyond, we have to identify and resolve all these anomalous events. This requires us redefining some of the fundamentals of anomaly detection, piecing together unrelated contextual clues, and it must be over time series. We're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, specifically as it relates to machine programming. So going back to our outline, I wanted to talk to you about the AI boom. We, we went over these quick three, and now we're going to spend the rest of the talk talking about the future, how this stuff might or might not apply to machine programming. So machine programming, in essence, is this idea that we will have our computers write our code for us. And if you talk to some of the leaders in the field, they are sort of in alignment that this is an emerging revolution in computer science that is, is starting to take off. For example, uh, Jeff Dean is quoted back in 2016 saying that if Google was created today, we wouldn't be writing code. The machines would essentially be doing a lot of it for us. And as many of you probably know, Jeff Dean is sort of an authority on uh, these types of things. In addition, we have this, this wired headline that says, we'll soon pr um, train our computers rather than program them uh, like our dogs. So I felt like since uh, they brought up dogs, I'm allowed now to go back to talking about dogs. And I did this little experiment to see how good I could train my dogs, because if I could train my dogs, well, I could train machines. So my goal is to not have my dog get on the couch. After a month of very rigorous training, this is what I came home to. So not only is he on the couch, he's like clearly intoxicated on the couch. So I sat down with him and we spent a very serious week of training and the result was this. Uh, now he has a buddy that's with him <laughs> asleep on the couch. So the, the, the scientific takeaway is literally this. Uh, some people just can't train dogs or machines. I'm probably one of them. And we need to find people who know what they're doing, specifically machine learning experts. Okay, so now this leads me into a more serious point about our three pillars paper that we published earlier this year on machine programming. So this is joint work between Intel and MIT. And the purpose of this work was really to lay out a uh, vision of what the future of machine programming looks like. And really what we categorize it into is these three school of, schools of thought, intention, invention, and adaptation. So intention is the notion that we're trying to discover the intent of the programmer. Today, intention is pretty much writing code, but can we raise the level of abstraction? Can it be spoken language? Can it be diagrams? Can it be something that allows us to generate code faster? Invention, which is my favorite pillar, is this notion that we'll start using machine learning to explore new spaces in computer science that we as humans haven't explored, specifically creating new ML techniques, creating new data structures, new programming languages, what have you. The idea is that this thing did not exist before and a machine actually came up with it. And we'll see a little, a, a few examples of early work in that space. And then the last pillar is adaptation. This is the idea that once we deploy code as software developers and, and uh, software researchers, we know that once you deploy code, now the job has just started, right? It's an ongoing task to fix bugs, patch security holes, and on top of that, as the hardware ecosystem changes underneath us, we have to adapt to that to make sure that our code is running most efficiently. 
So that really is what is captured in the adaptation pillar. And you can see from this diagram some examples. So intention kind of spills off in program synthesis and inductive programming. Adaptation is a lot about optimizations and um, security. And then the invention is these ideas of doing cool things like creating new algorithms, so on and so forth. So now, to kind of tie back our earlier themes of computer vision, natural language processing, and anomaly detection for autonomous vehicles, these are actually strong related, strongly related to the three pillars. So the first is intention. Computer vision and natural language processing, I believe, will play a fundamental role. And what's great is both of those fields have matured very quickly. So natural language processing probably seems very intuitive that if we can get to a spoken language where we're having a dialogue, sort of like back in Star Trek where Scotty's saying, computer, do this, you know, if we can get to that point, that's very much an NLP, NLU problem. Computer vision, on the other hand, is work that one of my colleagues is looking at, uh, Armando Solar Lazama at MIT, and he's doing really interesting work that's trying to demonstrate that you can have a computer look at pictures, and from those pictures you can actually create code. And so he has a working example, I think, where he can create LaTeX code based on a diagram that will then actually show the correct diagram that you've drawn on a napkin uh, actually in LaTeX. So early work, but it's, it's, it's promising. For the invention pillar, again, this is sort of one of the, in my mind, maybe the most novel. And so I'm not entirely sure what goes into this space. If you have ideas, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm going to show you some early work from Tim Kraska. This is a joint work between MIT and Google. And there's another work with uh, Lee and, and Malik from Berkeley where they do learning to optimize, where they actually are doing some invention of a new optimization algorithm for machine learning. But it's still sort of an open space. I'm not sure exactly what we call this thing here and what the overlapping connection is. And then lastly, for adaptation, we really think that the anomaly detection and mitigation will fall into this space because as we think about software and machine programming, software bugs, I would consider anomalies. Security flaws, I would also consider as anomalies, and so on and so forth. So what's nice is that in the space of autonomous vehicles, which is forced to make advancements for them to be adopted at level four and beyond, we can actually leverage that technology and use it for machine programming. And I'll show some concrete work. This is actually one of the primary areas that our NIPS paper is focusing on. Okay, so beyond just the fact that I think machine programming is gonna be the future, what we're seeing at Intel is it's actually bigger than that. So yes, Intel is, is betting on AI. We have our own AI conference now. Uh, machine programming is emerging. There's a lot of people that are starting to become interesting, interested in it, and potentially it's a revolutionary shift. Uh, and part of the reason why we did the pillars is to create a community. We, want a, we don't want it to be just us. We want to rally the troops, right? We realize this is a, an enormous problem. We need everyone working on it. And as you can see, it overlaps with many of the existing ML domains today, and we're just on the, the precipice of starting to explore this. But it's actually even bigger than all that. I would argue that machine programming is inevitable, and in order for us to make forward progress in computer science, we have to adopt it. So one concrete example of that is this. So here I have six different compute devices. Let me walk you through them. And these are all just Intel. I'm not looking at any of the other manufacturers. This is a Nirvana uh, neural processor unit. This is a Stratix 10 Intel Altera uh, field programmable gate array. This is the Lohi spiking neural network neuromorphic computing device. This is a GPU. Believe it or not, this is the CPU. <laughs> And then lastly, we have uh, non-volatile memory, which requires some really interesting potential programming language paradigm shifts. So my question to you is, how many of you think that you can program one of these correctly and efficiently? And what I mean by that, let's just sort of dissect those two words. Correctly, I mean it does what you want it to do. That you can make it bug-free, or relatively bug-free, and there aren't these massive security holes, and then efficiently, I'll let you define that. If you think you're writing efficient code, I'll just trust you 
that you're getting close to bare metal performance, that kind of thing. So how many of you in the audience think that you can program just one of these correctly and efficiently? My personal thing is I think I can get close with CPUs. Anybody else? Okay, so I see uh, you know, a few nods. Of like, okay, yeah, I feel a little comfortable with the idea that I can maybe program one of these correctly and efficiently. I like that, that's great. We're all sort of hesitant because we know, I think as researchers, this is actually a very hard problem to do under the constraints I just provided. But now let's make the question a little bit more complicated. This is the heterogeneous hardware ecosystem we live in today. Who can do that? All of them. I have yet to meet a single person that would say that they can do just three of them. But this is the future, right? This is not going away. And again, this doesn't cover any of the stuff that Google's doing with tensor processing units, um, what AMD is doing, what NVIDIA is doing, and so on and so forth. Facebook, I guess, is going to start doing its own hardware. So this is just going to become exacerbated. It's not going to go away. It's going to become more diverse. And if that's the case, really no one can program these things. In that sense, machine programming has to become inevitable. In order for us to harness the compute power of that type of heterogeneity, we have to have machine programming. So we, me and one of my colleagues, Tatiana Schleisman, we kind of observed this shift back in 2015, and we co-founded this research center. It's an Intel NSF partnership on computer-assisted programming for heterogeneous architectures, CAPA. I'm the principal investigator of CAPA. It's a three-year center, $6 million, and we have uh, 13 universities, sorry, we have seven universities, 13 professors, and dozens of grad students involved in this effort. And even this, we think, is just sort of the, the tip of the iceberg. We need to do a lot more in order to make progress in this machine programming space. So now going back to the three pillars, one of the things that we're looking to do is stand up a new center at MIT. It's still in the process, and if this does actually go through, Armando Solar Lozama will be leading it, and myself and Tim Matson from Intel side will be working uh, the ind industry side. And the three pillars will be a central theme to this, this center. In fact, the three pillars are already a central theme to the MIT center we just stood up earlier this year uh, called DSAIL. Uh, and so I think Tim Matson presented a little bit on the three pillars and how it affects uh, data related uh, to AI. In addition, the three pillars are actually fundamentally shifting the way that we're doing work in programming systems at Intel. So we're redefining our own research agenda around the three pillars. And the, I guess the key takeaway here is we need to make sure that we focus, we have a very focused agenda on our research. Otherwise, we'll start to have weaknesses in one of the pillars and then we won't be able to deliver an entire um, fully executed ecosystem on machine programming. So for example, if we do really well on the intention pillar, but we straddle with the adaptation pillar, sure, we can deliver code, and it's just gonna be full of bugs, and it's not gonna evolve as the hardware ecosystem evolves, and mostly people are gonna think it's useless. We don't want that. So that's sort of the rallying call behind the three pillars. So now to give you a little bit more insight concretely into the research that's being done in this space. I want to just walk you th through some work that I'm fond of, and then lastly we'll talk about the adaptation work, which is one of the areas that uh, my team and our collaborators in academia are focusing on. So the first is the work by Simic Uwani on Flashville. So how many of you know Flashville? Awesome. Yeah, that's great. I suspect Flashville is probably one of the most popular pieces of uh, program synthesis, uh, intentionality, for the three pillars that's out there. Uh, I'm very good friends with Cement, and he tells me, I think uh, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions pe of people use it in Excel. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful tool, and what it does is basically, uh, it, it tries to understand very quickly based on things that you have, and then give you ideas of what you're trying to do. So it, it eliminates a lot of the busy work. This is understanding the human's intention. I think it's very promising early work, and we need more of this type of thing. Another piece of work that I'm a big fan of is uh, program synthesis by sketching. How many of you have heard of sketching? Okay, great. Sketching is also pretty popular. The idea is essentially, 
It's different than submits work. The idea is that you may have a hole in some of your code, but if you analyze the code as a, from a holistic view, the program synthesizer may be able to reason about what is missing in there. And I believe that sketching is continuing to evolve, and I, I believe that Armando's trying to integrate a machine learning component uh, in it as well. So it's not just program synthesis, now it'll have an ML piece. So for invention, as I mentioned earlier, invention is my favorite pillar. Unfortunately, I don't have any work of my own, I think, to brag about in the intention pillar, so, or invention pillar. Hopefully in the near future that will change. But one of the pieces of works that I'm very much a fan of is this work by Kraska et al., The Case of Learned Index Structures. What's really interesting is they just took these, it, the idea is actually very basic. They took these existing data structures and then found a component in them that they could replace with an ML model. And that's it. And the results were surprising. So they basically took this B tree, they yanked out this guy and use a uh, neural network model for the indexing. And then they realized that a hash function is just basically a heuristic. And if you have some knowledge of the data of that heuristic a priori before you use that hash table, then you can increase the, the efficiency by learning what the, the data uh, signature looks like significantly. Very promising work. Really exciting. So I encourage, if you haven't read this paper, I, I encourage all of you to take a look at it. It's, it's really inspiring. But again, we need to go much further. I envision a space where we're not just simply repa replacing one component of the data structure, we're replacing the entire data structure. We're replacing the entire programming language. We're inventing new hardware. And so lastly, we have adaptation. Uh, the work that we'll be presenting next month at NIPS is this precision and recall for time series. And I'm going to spend a good chunk of the talk going in detail about this. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about this Intel MIT collaboration on anomaly detection interpretability. And hopefully both of those things will be uh, exciting. So at this point, I want to just pause for a second and ask, are there any questions? You want to throw at me to make it a little more dynamic? Okay, great. I'll continue then. Feel free to interrupt. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to focus entirely on adaptation. We're not going to look at anything else. And it's going to be principally within the context of machine programming. So before we can do that, and we want to talk about anomaly detection first, we, you need a little background. Probably all of you already know this, but just as a refresher, when you're talking about anomaly detection, the nomenclature that the general community uses are these things like precision recall F1, F beta score. They're calculated using these types of things. You have true positives, you have true negatives, false positives, false negatives, and if you want to see it pictorially, this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, and when you have values for all of this based on your, the performance of your anomaly detector against real data, then you can calculate things like precision recall and an F1 score. But it turns out this really just doesn't work when you're considering time series data. So classically, if you look at precision and recall, F1, F beta score, if you're considering point-based anomalies or even basic things like what it was invented for, document classification. It works very well that you can see in this picture here, we have false negatives, true positives, false positives. You can categorize them and we can calculate precision and recall very efficiently. It leads us to something meaningful. But now if we shift over and start to consider this in the space of time, we sort of get into this little bit of a conundrum. So the first is, what happens when you have like a partial overlap here, where you have a real anomaly, and then you have a prediction, but the prediction only covers one portion of that anomaly? How do we grade that? And does the position matter? Is it going to be more important if the prediction is at the front end of the real anomaly and misses, uh, mispredicts earlier values? Or is it better at the tail end? And likewise, what happens when you have a prediction that maybe overlaps multiple anomalies? How do you classify this? How do you evaluate anomaly detection systems in the space of time series using precision and recall? 
And basically, the argument that we have is you can't. You can't do it correctly anyway. So classical precision and recall, I'm a big fan of if you're doing point-based anomaly detection. But if you're trying to do time series, it simply just doesn't work. In addition, there is a scoring model called the Numenta Anomaly Benchmark Scoring Model. Uh, it's an interesting model. Their intuition on trying to work in the space of time series, I think, is uh, very well aligned with our goals. Uh, however, one of the problems with Numenta's scoring solution is they bake in the positional bias into the algorithm. What that basically means is it's only for early detection. There are cases when you actually will prefer late detection. Consider a missile defense system that it cannot have false positives. It can have false negatives, but you cannot fire that missile prematurely and be wrong. This is a case where you might actually want to delay and have a tail bias, not a front bias. In addition, Numenta has some other curiosities to it. There are some irregularities or some magic numbers. And so we felt like there's essentially growth that we need to make beyond what Numenta was providing. So we came up with a new model. This model is a mathematical model specifically to score anomaly detectors. Keep in mind, we're not creating a new model for anomaly detection. We're trying to create the framework that you will use to grade the anomaly detectors. And the goal is that it should be expressive, flexible, and extensible. It should be a superset of other systems that if you need it to replicate the classical model, it can, ours can. If you need it to behave similarly to other evaluators, it can, ours can. Uh, the, the most important point, though, is we want it to have practical meaningfulness. What I mean by that is the current technology for anomaly detectors is this. We evaluate these systems. They do very well in a sandbox environment. We're getting F1 scores of like one, which is a perfect F1 score. It's incredible. That means you have perfect uh, precision and perfect recall. It's like astronomically good. Then we take those systems and we put them in the real world and they fail miserably. We get the Tesla crash into the barrier, right? They have anomaly detection systems in there. They just don't work for time series um, anomalies. So what we want is a system where you can evaluate this in a sandbox environment. And the score that you get with these things is reflective of the score you would actually get in the real world. If it does that, then we're doing better. Then we can actually, right now, we can't fault the models. We can't fault you guys creating an amazing ML model that gets a perfect F1 score. And you're like, oh my gosh, look at this. This is incredible. You publish a paper about it. Then BMW decides to pick it up, and BMW vehicles are crashing. And they come back to you and say, what's going on? Right. So it's not your fault if you're using the wrong evaluation metrics. We need to fix those. And that's what our, our goal with this NIPS paper is. So if you are going to NIPS, I encourage you to uh, seek us out. We'd love to talk to you more about this. Um, we have actually already delivered this technology to BMW, and they're starting to investigate its use for their autonomous vehicles. We, one of the things that I do at Intel is I run the anomaly detection collaboration between Intel and BMW, and so we actually just delivered this tech to them uh, two weeks ago. So very quickly, if you want to see more of the concrete details of this work, it basically comes down to us doing two things. We redefined recall, so it's range-based, it's time series, and we redefined precision, so it's range-based. That's essentially it. We spent a year and a half arguing about what these two equations would look like. Uh, my, my collaborators, especially Nesime, who's the lead author of this, would say, no, 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 it's much more than that. Yes, there are tons of experiments that we ran. There's lots of models we analyzed, but in, at the end of the day, it's really just these two equations. And what these equations essentially do, I don't expect any of you to be able to grok all of this, but what they allow you to do is build in a positional bias. So if you need to detect anomalies early, you can control it by uh, these various knobs. And they're, they're also entirely extensible. So if you have your own implementation on precisely how it should behave, you have access to that. You can also control things like the cardinality, how it should be rewarded for overlap size, some of the problems that I pointed out on the earlier slides. So when we presented this to BMW earlier in the year, they said, hey, we think the equations are great, but we don't want to implement these things. This is going to be a royal pain. 
So build us a software package and allow us to just interface with the software package where we just give you two data sets, the real data set with the anomalies in it and our model's predicted data set, and then you spit out a score. So since BMW is the boss here, that's what we did. <laughs> we built this thing called the TSAT evaluator. It uh, does just that. It takes two input files. One is the real data set. One is the prediction data set. And then it's, it spits out uh, your scores. Fully customizable. So we have some pre-built uh, choices where it allows you to have a front bias, a mid bias, a tail bias, and some other interesting things. But it's also extensible. Uh, you can directly access the source code and build in your own uh, gamma and, and uh, omega functions, or uh, delta functions. We are planning to open source this just before NIPS. So we're, Intel is a, a, a big company and the process to get things open sourced within Intel is sometimes overly painful, but we're, we're working on it and our goal is that before NIPS happens, in our presentation, we'll give you a GitHub link and you will have full access to this. Everything's completely open, uh, MIT license, do whatever you want, fork it, uh, you know, extend it, add cool new stuff. If you add new positional bias things that you think are interesting, let us know, email me or Nesame, and we'll consider pulling those in into um, the main, main branch. Okay. So throughout this talk, I've been kind of uh, showing the good and bad of, of other companies. But I think it's important for me also to, you know, focus on Intel a little. Intel is not perfect as well. Uh, as some of you may have heard, we have these things called Spectre and Meltdown. Who, who in the room has have heard of what these things are? Okay, great. Yeah, pretty much everybody. Yeah, so um, <laughs> these, are, these are hardware vulnerabilities, and they're based around speculation. Uh, Basically, it's very difficult to fix these properly. And what we've also realized is this is potentially just the tip of the iceberg. There may be many more hardware vulnerabilities and even different classes of hardware vulnerabilities for Intel. If that's the case, one of the ways that we can try to stop these things or mitigate them is we can build an anomaly detection system that will detect this type of rogue behavior and then try to take some kind of action. And so we're actively working on doing this within Intel, and the evaluation techniques, again, are the core for that. Because if we can't measure these things properly, we won't be able to build a model that behaves correctly in the real world. So I'm not just picking on Microsoft and Apple, I'm also picking on Intel. And my picking on companies is not finished yet. <laughs> Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the evaluation stuff. What about interpretability? So this is, a, this is a hot topic right now. If you're in neural networks, one of the major issues that people have with neural nets is yes, they give us the right answer most of the time, maybe you know, almost all the time. But sometimes it gives you an answer that you don't like and we just don't know why. And the theoreticians out there that I've worked with, they get very upset when I say things like, well, I can't actually explain <laughs> what the neural network is doing, but let's just trust that this is the right answer. They really don't like that. And this was part of the reason why I think we had sort of the AI winter with neural networks is, well, there are a number of reasons, but this didn't help. So one of the projects that we're working on now uh, is anomaly detection interpretability. And the anomaly detection models we're building are all deep learning models that are using neural networks. So this doubles. This is useful in multiple directions. First of all, a lot of the prior work in anomaly detection has been focused on the detection, not necessarily the mitigation. But if we think about autonomous systems, like autonomous vehicles, machine programming, we not only need to be able to detect the bug, we need to be able to autonomously patch it. Security holes, that type of thing. So it turns out that the anomaly detection aspect and neural network interpretability, they overlap very well on these two open questions about how and why. So the first thing, uh, that we built at Intel is this thing called AutoPerf, which is a zero positive learning uh, autoencoder. Zero positive learning is just a subset of a um, one class classifier. You know, those are basically, you only use one class to train it and it learns the other class or the other classes. And so zero positive learning is basically just the thought that if you apply it specifically for anomaly detection, it only looks at the negative space. We don't look at anomalies, only non-anomalous data. 
And the idea there is twofold. One, in many cases, you won't have anomalous data in the real world. You will have tons of non-anomalous data. So this is the common theme that I'm being hit by, is people in different business units, different uh, companies, they have a lot of non-anomalous data, but no anomalous data. Although they know the anomalies exist. So this is, uh, this is a piece of work that we like because it helps focus our research on a practical system for, for industry. And AutoPerf uh, is an autocoder, autoencoder, which is basically a neural network that tries to generate the identity function. And you basically have a, a layout of, of what AutoPerf is doing here. So we teamed up with MIT and Armando and, and Zin, uh, Shen, and decided that what we do is try to take our AutoPerf system and apply it to their neural network judgment system. So this is work that also just got accepted to NIPS, so they'll be presenting that as well. And the idea is simply this, that you can take a neural network and it will visually output things for you to tell you if you're in the category that you want to be in. Uh, the primary output is going to be actionable. This is the important thing. So for example, if you're applying for a mortgage, it might show that you here's your debt to income ratio, here's your interest rate, and it could output that, well, you're here, but you want to get into this uh, non-anomalous state so you can actually get the mortgage. And so you might be able to intuit that this, is, this overlaps very well with anomaly detection because we can think of this, at least in a simple example, as a bifurcated space. Anything that's inside of this triangle is not anomalous. Everything outside of it is anomalous. So we put these two systems together, and it looks sort of like this. We have some features that we ingest into our neural network, AutoPerf. It outputs these anomalous data points. We then use MIT's Polaris system. It gives us some explanation of these anomalous events. We do some analysis, and then we have some potential for corrective action. What's great about this, in my mind, is it can be used in many different spaces. So we plan to use this for our autonomous vehicle research. We also believe that this can be used for software anomalies, whether they're performance, correctness, or security. And probably even more, more interesting is, it looks like it's working. Uh, early work, this is very early work, we, we've got a long way to go, but we took some uh, performance anomalies and parallel software and use AutoPerf to identify them and then we fed that data into Polaris and Polaris printed out this really pretty picture for us and said here's where you are and here's where you need to be for the non-anomalous space and if you're familiar with hardware performance counters you might know that these are things like the branch instruction uh, L3 um, hit ems on cache coherence <coughs> And basically it's saying what you need to do is just reduce your hit M's and you're going to be able to get out of this performance anomaly. And intuitively, this makes a lot of sense. So we're at the point now to where we can use these systems together and it can tell us the direction that we need to move in the space to solve the problem. Uh, our goal is to approach the round trip, right? The round trip is the identification of the anomaly and fully autonomous mitigation. We're not quite there yet, but our early results seem to indicate that we're moving well in this space. So we're not the only ones. Obviously, there's lots of people that are interested in this, this adaptation pillar. And one of them is Facebook. I don't know if many of you have heard of this, but Facebook just recently announced, it's just a couple months ago, that they have an automatic bug fixing system. There are not many details. Uh, if there's anyone from Facebook in the audience that wants to share more details with me later, I'd love to learn more about this. Uh, but we're very interested. We're excited to see that this work is emerging and it's being already used in industry. So it's not just us that's focusing on this adaptation. There are other big players like Facebook that are deploying real systems that are solving these problems. Okay, so if I want to be on time, it looks like I've got about nine minutes to wrap everything up. Now we're going to talk a little bit about self-awareness. I might go through this a little fast, and I apologize. So self-awareness 
is this notion that there are gonna be times where an autonomous system needs to make a very difficult decision. Some of you may know what this uh, problem is. This is the pedestrian's dilemma for autonomous vehicles, and there are essentially two choices here. The vehicle collides with these pedestrians, or the vehicle collides with this thing, and there's no scenario that has a good outcome. So how can we deal with this? And why does this impact machine programming? So let's take a step back and let's ask ourselves how this might affect machine programming. So I just gave Facebook a little bit of praise. Now it's fair to give them a little slap. So let's imagine you have this scenario where you have this massive data breach and N individuals private data is being hacked. What does the machine programming do? What does the machine programmer do? Does it fix the bug? Does it not fix the bug? What do you guys think? Fix the bug? Who says fix the bug? Okay, cool. Who says don't fix the bug? Depends on what's being it depends what? On what's being optimized. It depends on what's being optimized, absolutely. And there are other factors. So this is sort of the straw man, right? Is that we look at the problem like this and we say, oh, you'd always fix the bug. But let's make it a little bit more complicated now. Let's add one more constraint to this problem. And let's say that if we delay fixing it, we can gather more data and then we can potentially identify the hackers and prevent them from further infiltrating other systems. Now what do we do? I would argue that even in this scenario, there's still no clear case. Basically what we need to do is we need to understand the role of the machine programmer. So if the machine programmer is a firefighter, yes, I would say the response is you fix this. If the machine programmer is an FBI agent, maybe you delay. Maybe you gather more data and you focus on a bigger crime, right? Take out the whole ring rather than fix this one problem. Because as soon as you fix it, they know it's fixed. They're on to other things. So the point of this is self-awareness is actually a very hard problem. And it's going to be specific to the machine programmer. We will argue that generally it's going to be based on priorities. Uh, who here is familiar with Isaac Asimov's Laws of Robotics? Is anybody? L let's hear him. Do I don't know it in my heart. But... Okay. Do you want to give like a rough guess? Well, something with no harming humans. Great. Yep. No harming humans. That's in there. That, that's one of them. Are, there's two more. No harming of themselves, I think. Yeah, I think that that's in there as well. Let's, let's take a look. Here's what they are. Yeah, so no harm in humans. Uh, oh, you have to obey, except where the, the obeying would harm the humans. And then, yeah, like you said, protect your own existence type of thing. What we would argue is that these laws, which we think are also these priorities, they're all anomalous events. These are all anomalies. The normal behavior is not going to be that a human is going to be harmed. It's only going to be those rare times. And so if we think about this in that context, we can expand it a little bit and say that, yes, these will generally be anomalous in nature, but they also may be dynamic. So we may have these machine programmers that evolve over time and their priorities will change. Uh, maybe there are different levels of security threats. Some of them are minor, some of them are major, and the role of the machine programmer may change from firefighter to FBI agent slowly. The, the key takeaway is that for us to have self-aware systems, they need to understand their purpose, and this is critical for the adaptation layer. And so we're actually focusing on establishing a research agenda with Penn now that is going to work in the space of focusing on dynamic prioritization of anomalies specifically for this self-awareness problem, which is a very hard open problem. This is sort of just, again, the, a very small glimpse into the complexity one could imagine. If you think about it a little bit more, it, it sort of becomes a wildfire. Okay, so in conclusion, we saw a bunch of successes and failures in these three different spaces. I then uh, tried to show how those three domains impact machine programming. Um, we talked about the three pillars of machine programming, the intention, invention, and adaptation, and then we quickly closed with this analysis of the criticality for self-awareness in machine programming. But that's not it. 
if you're interested in this, if you have interest in machine programming or anomaly detection in any of these spaces, I definitely want you to reach out and contact me and we can be like Bono together at NIPS. <laughs> and that's it. So at this point, I'll take questions in the three minutes I think I have remaining. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the back. Okay, so let me just repeat his question. This is a great question, by the way. So he's asking, are you assuming that the sampling of the time series data that's potentially coming from multiple sources is going to be uniform? And if it's not uniform, how do you generalize? So our first pass is that with that work, the assumption is that it is uniform. And there's a couple different methods that we've been looking at that we can talk about offline. None of them, in my mind, seem like they generalize very well. You have to make, there's, there's places where you do estimations, you do expansions. Um, there's a lot of guessing because we don't have the data precisely for those missing intervals. Uh, or if we do have the data, like we expand to the, the widest interval for whatever data, we then potentially don't use all the data that we have uh, to try to make it uniform. So I would say this is, at least from my mind, an open problem, especially to use with our evaluation system. Uh, but we can definitely talk more offline. Great question. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, there are non-parametric smoothers like Bill Cleveland's low OS and others that could allow you to compute smooth and then uh, compute even minimal size smooth. Is that the case you Yeah, absolutely. And so we've looked at some of that stuff. I think that the only problem is that for, from what I've seen, and, and you may know more than I do, is that with those smoothing techniques, it generally makes the assumption that that behavior will have some sort of smooth um, output. And if it deviates from that in the real data, then our estimations are going to be wrong. So if you have spikes in the real data, then we would estimate incorrectly. Well, that's what ProS, for example, is designed to do, is to downweight those spikes using a robust function. So in effect, it, it's, it's its own uh, outlier detector for given window that it's just, just yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you offline about this in more detail. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, also about the anomaly time series, uh, anomaly detection for uh, precision memory call. Um, if, is there like a notion of, of importance in the anomalies? Like if you, are, mm. if you are somehow removing bugs from software code, and then becomes sparser and sparser, but also more catastrophic and more catastrophic. Is there some kind of way to encapsulate that? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so just to repeat his question, the, the question is, do you have some sort of priority system as you are starting to attack these anomalies such that you're considering the side effects of those fixes? Maybe the initial side effect is benign that you, you fix some software defect, but then because you're fixing these things, the system becomes more reliable, and then when you have some other new failures, they become catastrophic. So it's it's a very complicated question. There's, there's really no way we could possibly answer this in 30 seconds, but I will say this is part of the research that we're kicking off with Penn, because this is supremely important to autonomous vehicles, obviously, uh, when human life is at risk. And I also think as you're starting to build machine programming systems that are for safety critical systems, like autonomous vehicles or what have you, those will also be very critical. And, and they also have the constraint of real time as well. So there's many, many issues associated with that question. It's a brilliant question. Uh, really, I think we're just on the, the, the beginning slide of how to address that. And if you have ideas, I'd love to hear your thoughts offline. <laughs> Please solve this problem for us. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you all so much.